Library Week may have been around for a while, but it is the mystique of an ancient library that brings us here today. The ancient library of Alexandria, Egypt, captured the imagination of the world and remains one of the greatest adventures of the human intellect. Established in 288 BC to bring together the greatest minds of the ancient world, the library grew to become the greatest library of the age and the intellectual center of the world, much like the CF library. Some 1600 years after its final destruction, the library was revived, almost exactly on the same spot on the shores of the Mediterranean. The new Bibliotheca Alexandrina was intended to capture the spirit of the original. We are honored to have Dr. Soher Wastawi here today to tell us about the library, ancient and modern. Dr. Wastawi is the Dean of Libraries at Florida Institute of Technology. She was the Dean of the University Libraries at Illinois State University, and earlier was the first Chief Librarian of the New Library of Alexandria. Prior to her work in Alexandria, she was the Dean of Libraries at Illinois Institute of Technology for 14 years. Dr. Wastawi received her BA and MA and completed work toward a PhD thesis in linguistics at Cairo University, Egypt. She has a master's degree in library and information science from the Catholic University of America and a doctorate degree in library and information management from Simmons College. It is my great pleasure to present Dr. Wastawi. Thank you very much for this introduction and congratulations to all the librarians for the National Library Week. I hope you are proud of the profession and how far uh, we have come. And you will see sometimes we go quite far to find ourselves at the beginning of, of, of something really interesting. And you will see that when I speak about a library that is almost more than 2,300 years old. Um, Okay, um, I'm before I start um, uh, talking about the ancient library, um, I just want to say uh, why this library had been memorable and why it stayed in the uh, mind of most humans or most intellectual for that many years. There is definitely a number of reasons. But just to talk about the library, I'll talk about when did it start and I'll talk about the history of that period because it is important for how the library had um, um, uh, continued its quest for knowledge. Uh, the, the story of the library began 2300 years ago in 295 uh, PC. And um, by no means it wasn't the first library in antiquity. There was a library of Pergamon, there, was libraries, there were libraries in Athens, there were libraries in a number of areas. This library was quite different for a number of reasons. Um, and I'll speak about it. It all started with Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, um, as you know, he was quite um, um, a military man. He tried to conquer so many countries. Um, he was not only a conqueror or an, a, 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 a mighty uh, military person, but he also was an intellectual. And he built um, a, a great empire in a very short time. Alexandria was one of the places that he had loved when he tried to conquer this area and on the shore of the Mediterranean. And it, it, it has its, his namesake. He really had uh, conquered Alexandria and loved it enough to say this would be the capital of his empire. And he left Alexandria to conquer some other places. If you see how big his empire is, um, you'll see how large is the area that he had conquered and you'll see he had gone all the way next to the Himalayas and all the way in Asia and, and, and Europe. Um, Alexandria, unfor uh, Alexander, unfortunately, 
did not live to see uh, Alexandria being built as, as uh, his capital. He fell after, his, um, after he came to Alexandria, he went to uh, conquer some other places, and he returned to Egypt in a sarcophagus that we still cannot find. Um, uh, his, his empire was quite big. He came to Egypt in 331 BC, uh, and he commissioned a very well-known architect uh, called the Necratus of building the city. The city was built to the best of the standards of the Roman Empire at the time, and all kind of um, paved the streets, believe it or not, uh, lots of buildings. There was an area that was called the Royal Quarter, and it was right on the Mediterranean where he put the library, so the li uh, where the library was built. Um, after he commissioned um, uh, um, the, the Necratus was building the library, uh, was building the city, he left uh, to Asia, and because he did not return alive, Ptolemy or Suter the first, Ptolemy first or Suter was the person who really has the credit in relation to um, a building, um, uh, the Library of Alexandria and the city of Alexandria. Alexander died at the age of 33, um, and from that point, many of the people who were the schoolmates, one of the things that you may not know about Alexander, that he was taught by Aristotle. So this is someone that was his professor. Um, uh, at the time. I always wonder what it's like to be taught by somebody like that. It must be really quite an interesting to be tutored by Aristotle. Um, so uh, Ptolemy very much was very, uh, was very much uh, before, this is the beginning of the Ptolemaic time, is, um, was, was Alexander's sidekick. So he, once Alexander didn't return, he started taking over. And one of the most interesting things is the role of women in the Library of Alexandria, and it started very early on. And two women in particular, some of them that you may be familiar with the name, uh, and some are not. Uh, Prenki, uh, who is the wife of the first Ptolemy, was one of the people who had the wisdom, and it's not about actually uh, she, she is the one who asked Ptolemy I to have her son, Ptolemy II, share the, um, the rule with him. He was a wiser individual, wiser than her other children, and she insisted that he become one who rules with his father. And Ptolemy II ruled with his father for, 80, for eight years, and 40, to, 40 years after that alone. So Bernice was able to see that, that kind of wisdom. The image that you see, it's her picture, and uh, the, um, the coin that actually exists is uh, her picture with uh, her uh, husband. Um, the second person that you would uh, know about is another woman, is Cleopatra, and we will speak about her. But one of the things that I wanted to say that Cleopatra is Cleopatra the seventh. There are six other Cleopatras before her, but nobody given a darn about them. It is just it's only um, that Cleopatra the seventh um, that is the one uh, that is most important to us. Uh, Ptolemy II, or Philadelphia, he is the one who actually had seen a great deal of the advancement that, overseen the great deal of the advancement that happened in the library. The city of, the, of Alexandria became the intellectual capital of the world because of its two remarkable things. One of them was the uh, lighthouse on the island of Pharos, and it's called Pharos. Um, the lighthouse called the Pharos itself, and the library. The lighthouse was an architectural miracle in and of itself. It is supposedly one of the um, uh, seven wonders of the world of the ancient time. 
Um, some of the stones of the Paros still exist until now. It was taken down after an earthquake, and after the earthquake, some of the stones were taken to build the citadel. And if you go to Egypt and you go on right on that island inside and in the in um, the Mediterranean, you will see that um, the, those um, stones in there. Um, the second was the Library of Alexandria. The library, um, when Ptolemy um, wanted to build the library, he asked someone, his name Demetrius of Halloran, who was uh, a poet and was a statesman in um, Greece who had left it at the time. He left Athens and came to Alexandria. And Demetrius was um, um, uh, an intellectual. And when Ptolemy asked for his advice to how to make Alexandria the capital of the world, he said, the intellectual capital of the world, he said for any place to become a, a, an important intellectual type of place, what you need is to have to hire a great number of scientists. So what he did, he hired more than 100 scientists. And he said, just don't give them any jobs. Just leave them alone and they will produce. And this is really actually not new. Many of you may remember that when Prinison hired um, Einstein to head the Institute of Advanced Studies, they told him, all what you need to do, here is your lab, here is um, the office, all what you do whatever you want, just come and do anything that you want. We know you are going to produce something and we all know what Einstein has done. Um, same is still happening until this day when we see the MacArthur Foundation gives the grants called the Genius Grants, and these for people who have great ideas. They don't ask for any certain output, not even a report. I have known a person who had um, gotten one of these grants, and they don't ask for absolutely nothing. It is just people um, um, send reports because they want to send reports to say uh, what happened. Many of you might have heard there's a program on NPR called Radio Lab, and uh, Radio Lab is one of those um, uh, products out of the MacArthur grant. Um, Jad Abumrad, who is the person who did that program, had had um, a MacArthur grant, and he took. He didn't have the money to begin this program, so that's what he did. He took that money and worked on that program, and definitely produced an incredible. Um, uh, program. The library was not called the library. The library was called the museum, and the museum is the Greek word for a museum, but the museum was different than the concept of what we have today as a museum. A museum came from the word muses, and there are those eight well-known or nine well-known muses, muses of poetry, of myth, and so this was a temple a temple for the muses. And that's why it was called the Museum. Um, and the library um, at that time um, was not just a library. It was much more than a library. And I'm not saying that that the library is a small thing. But a library, and which is a concept that we are trying to impart even in our academic institutions on, in, on all other individuals who saw that the library is associated with the container, which is the book. Libraries are not about books. Libraries is about information and service. Libraries is about learning. And in learning, you use all kind of containers. That's being the book or the digital. You use all kind of information, that being oral, that being a piece of art in the wall. Uh, all that communicates certain information, and so is the Library of Alexandria. I know this picture is the same picture that you see down here. And this is really, I want you to look at the top of the column. It is quite important to take care of. This was, came from some of the illustrations that in early history, and it is amazing that only 15 or 12 years ago it became, this is accurate in terms of how the library columns look like. Um, when um, a Polish and French expeditions into the Eastern Harbor in Alexandria, um, had gone into the sea because um, the, 
the earthquake have taken most of Alexandria from that time right into the sea. These columns were found. And uh, when the artist did the, this picture or depicted this picture of the Library of Alexandria, he used that from the coin that was um, uh, uh, minted for the celebration of the library. But actually, we found the column, we found the, the, the coins as well. And so this is very much would be most uh, close to accurate for what the, the, the library looked like. One of the other things that you, um, you might have seen the movie Agora. It was a British movie about Hypatia, one of the scientists and mathematicians of the Library of Alexandria. You will see the same picture, but in terms of a movie, so it was a moving picture, and it was actually something that built on the set. Um, it's, it's an excellent movie, and it's very much historically mostly accurate, um, almost. Uh, I, I, as far as I read, nothing in that movie, a lot of the movie just really takes it to the Hollywood level and just put a detail that is not needed and incorrect. That movie was mostly accurate. Uh, so the, the library was not just a library, it had a theater, it had labs, it had schools for children, it had um, um, a, zo a zoological uh, garden, it had a botanical garden, it had a number, it had a theater. So that is, these are tools of learning. So when we see a theater in a library nowadays, when we see all kinds of things in libraries that we see, it is part of the learning. You learn through the arts, you learn through all kinds of different mechanisms. So that was the Museum, or later named the Biblioteca Alexandrina, and Biblioteca Alexandrina is the Greek name for the library. <coughs> the library was always, also became famous not because of the, um, the collection it had, it became famous because it was the first library that deliberately working hard on the, the making knowledge universal. The transfer of knowledge is something that was important to the ancient um, scientists. One of the things that they used to do, they would take a copy of every book they see. Whenever they go on trips or conquer some other places, they bring books back. Codex, um, it wasn't a codex, it was just um, scrolls uh, at the time. And whenever ships, because Alexandria was a huge harbor uh, for in the ancient world, so whenever books, uh, uh, ships came, they inspect the ships for nothing but books. And they would take the books, and then instead of copy machines, they had seven subscriber, uh, subscribers in the library that would take the book and they scribe seven copies of it. Um, there was some complaints in the past that were found on some papyri that there was this unscrupulous behavior of the librarian of Alexandria of returning the false copy and not the original. But I guess that's what they did. So there was that kind of shady behavior to be able to amass that kind of collection. But they lent these books. They went far and to get this material, but also they lent it. In um, about seven years ago, in a small town called Fayum, um, 60 miles southwest of Cairo, um, there was a tomb that was found, and it had uh, like what you could call an envelope. But it was nothing but a roll of uh, a papyri covering something inside but we didn't have them, the, the inside material. It was only the cover with a seal that um, it, the seal says uh, loaned from the Library of Alexandria. So there was interlibrary loan then as well. <laughs> um, so that is part of the fame of the Library of Alexandria. That's why it stayed. It is people everywhere uh, knew of its uh, existence because of that exchange. Uh, again, you know that 
the Pergamon Library. Not so many people would speak about it today just because they didn't, uh, they, they only collected books and they worked into their own local area. But the Library of Alexandria went as far as China to get some of this material. At some point, they had 700,000 scrolls, which is estimated at that time to be 80% of what was available throughout the ancient world. The library itself worked on producing knowledge. The library was not just a place where you read or you have some interaction with others through theater, through poetry, or any of that. It was a place that was designed for learning. It was an academy. And part of that was really um, helped by the Egyptian culture and the Greek culture. And having these two uh, together had produced a great deal of uh, knowledge for the t at the time. Uh, the library uh, scrolls and the seven to eight scrolls would make one book of 300 octavo and a 300 octavo is when you take a piece of paper, you fold it eight times and that would be the size of an octavo book. So as you see, the, if you 700,000, that's quite a bit of book for antiquity. Um, they have achieved a great deal of, um, of, of science. One of the most important part is that they, it was equally accessible to all people in Alexandria, and they taught girls. This is a picture, this is a statue that was found when we were digging in the foundation, uh, for the foundation of the, to put the foundation of the library, the new library. And it's that a girl is studying at the Library of Alexandria. And as you see, I always say that it's really, she had a scroll in her lap, but looks like a laptop, just upside down. Um, so the girls were, and scientists, women scientists were also um, um, allowed or, or worked in the library. This is not such a thing as allowed, not allowed. There was no difference in, in, in the gender uh, treatment at that time. Um, one of the things that when the library increased the number of volumes, they had to build another library. So they built something called the Daughter Library, was later known as the Daughter Library. The Daughter Library was built in a temple of the Serapeum. The Serapeum was a temple that when the Greek and the Egyptian couldn't agree on worshiping the same God, everybody wants their God, and you know at that time they created their own. Um, so the Greek and the Egyptian got together and decided to create a God. And so they created Serapis. And Serapis was a God that the Egyptian and the Greek agreed to worship and to become their God. And this was the happy god of Alexandria for almost 700 years. And the flocks of hair on the forehead each re refer to uh, some group of origin. But this was the god of Alexandria. And as far as history is concerned, the only god that had been built by a committee. Um, but let me just go through some of the Alexandria scholars and share with you how many, uh, how much they have done and how uh, uh, the kind of advancement that had been done uh, that some of it stays with us until now. Uh, Kalamakas was a poet uh, and one of the greatest poets of the Hellenistic, uh, Hellenistic period. He described, um, he used to write poetry and Ptolemy told him just do something useful as I can write po po uh, poetry all the time. So he asked him to describe the Libya collection. So he described the Libya collection in 150 volumes. And the Libya collection was described, organized by subject and author within the uh, subject. And then was alphabetized or organized alphabetically. Um, and at the same time, it had um, um, a commentary that it gives you a brief about what the book is about, what, if it's good in quality, it just had a review. 
and that's why it was published in 150 volumes. And that was called the Pinacas, and because of that, Callimachus is considered the father of library science. Um, Articaris Arti was one of the people who had first said that the Earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around. That was quite important. Uh, although that was changed later on in, in uh, time, but it was one of the most important advancements that had happened in the history of science. Hipparchus was the person who calculated the length of the year within six and a half minutes of today's calculation. This is how accurate, given that the instrument they were dealt with just an instrument, they were not supercomputers or anything like what we have today. He compiled the first star catalog. He also devised the early formulation of trigon trigonometry. He established the, um, the calendar, and that's 365.25 days long. They established the leap year, which became, after that, the basis for the Julian calendar. Um, and it's called the Julian calendar because when Julius Caesar came to Egypt and he liked how this calendar, um, in, in, in uh, Rome, they used to, it used to snow in, in June because the calendars were not, it was Aristotelian calendar that they were using and it was really not really um, well calculated. So when he came to, and they used to crank the calendar every time it, it it, it is now in June, they go back and they, they change the calendar to January. So that's why sometimes when you read some of the old text, they would really have to be familiar with how the years were calculated then because there's a whole lot of mix up about that. So when Julius, calendar came, uh, Julius um, uh, Caesar came to Egypt, he adopted the calendar. Later it was changed to the um, uh, uh, Gregorian calendar. Erastinus is the third library director. I couldn't blame anything on that guy when I started becoming the library director there. Just, it was quite a few years before me. Um, he brought Archimedes in. He was a music theorist. He was the father of geography. He was a grammarian at the same time. Um, some of the things that Erastinus did is, um, um, is, is related to all the calendar. He also, the person who figured out the flood of the Nile, nobody figured out the flood of the Nile because there was not a whole lot of travel during that time down the Nile, very jungles area, and he was able to figure this out. He also calculated um, the circumference of Earth using shadows. The, he came for his calculation, the accuracy, um, uh, for the circumference of Earth is 98.25 of today's calculation. He also calculated the distance to the, uh, to the sun at 84% of what we have today. It is a remarkable achievement. He also mapped the world. And uh, I, I said before, he explained the, the, the Nile flood. Uh, Ptolemy, and many of you are familiar with Ptolemy as, um, uh, and his work in geography. He also explained the flood. He showed the origin of the Nile, that it comes really from way down in, in Africa. He uh, colored the Red Sea red the first time that the Red Sea showed as a red on a map. Most important, one of the most famous Alexandrian scholar was Euclid. Euclid has written his book, The Element of Geometry. It is the only book that in circulation from antiquity until this day. So that is how remarkable this book is. It's 2,250 years old book. Uh, Archimedes um, is one of considered the greatest experimental, experimental uh, physicist of antiquity. One of the things that he um, invented is a lever. He actually had a code that says, give me a place to stand on and I will move earth. 
And one of the things that he invented is a screw, and that elevates the water from the Nile. And this is exactly like the um, drawing that was existed, and 2,000 years later, it is being still used in some of the villages in Egypt to elevate water from the Nile into the fields. Uh, the translation of the Torah uh, from uh, Hebrew to, um, to um, Greek was one of the greatest achievements. Most of the Old Testament translation came from that time. And um, it's called Septuagint because 70 people have worked on the translation. They work different from one another, and then they compare the text after that to see how accurate was that translation. Uh, the reason Ptolemy asked that the Torah to be um, translated because the Egyptian Jews didn't um, know Hebrew. So he wanted them to be able to practice and so he had to have it translated in, Greece, in Greek. Uh, Manetto is the one who had, um, um, was an eminent historian. He chronicled the pharaohs, uh, a chronicler of the pharaoh. He organized the dynasties, and all these dynasties by numbers and name are the one that we are still use until now. So that's just something about the old library, how it was destroyed, when it was destroyed. Contrary to some of the faulty information that might you have seen in the literature, it was not destroyed by the Arabs. The Arabs went, didn't go there until 600 years after the library had been already destroyed. Um, the library was destroyed over three different periods and three different times. One of those times, um, and I said I was going to get back to Cleopatra, Cleopatra was a young princess of 18 years old who, was, um, who came to Egypt in 48 BC. She had been struggling with her brother over the, the rule of Egypt, and one of the things that happened is that she was clever enough. She put herself in, rolled herself in a carpet, and she went to Caesar's um, uh, quarters and to ask for his, his assistance with his brother. Um, I'd like to say something about um, Cleopatra here, because many of us would know Cleopatra through Hollywood movies and through, I mean, Shakespeare at the beginning and then all the Hollywood movies, and she really had this um, kind of terrible image as a, uh, as a femme fatale kind of woman. She wasn't, she was not Elizabeth Taylor. She was not that beautiful at all. She, that was Cleopatra. She was a woman of a great status in relation to intellect. She knew five, she spoke five languages. She was the only Greek who, speak, who spoke Egyptian languages and there's two of them at the time. So um, she was not, um, see both Caesar who fell in love with her as well as Mark Antony. They were the masters of the world. They could have had any woman they want. Cleopatra was not beautiful. Maybe she was rich, but they were way richer than she is. It was her brain that they were attracted to and her intellect at that time. Julius Caesar had, um, this is um, Julius Caesar, I, I mean, this is Ma uh, Mark Antony, and as you see, the two together don't make this couple. They are two very different couples and one another. And actually, we, <laughs> thanks to Hollywood, this distorts a whole lot of history <laughs> anyway. Um, so Julius Caesar fought the Alexandrian War. Um, and in the process, when he's trying to burn the fleet, the Cleopatra fleet, it was in the Eastern Harbor and where the library was, and the fire extended from the fleet, to, from the ships to the library, and that was uh, the first fire. There were three different fires happened in the history of the Library of Alexandria. So when the fire happened, um, um, and um, Caesar, uh, Caesar was helping Cleopatra against her brother. Um, later on, uh, Caesar uh, left 
to go to Rome and Mark Antony came. And when Antony came in 40, um, uh, Caesar was assassinated, sorry. And um, um, Mark Antony came and um, he definitely also fell uh, madly in love with Cleopatra, but he couldn't really get her to be um, um, just um, his companion. And so when the library burned, he went to the library of Pergamon and he gave her 200,000 scrolls from the Pergamon library to compensate for the loss for the burned material that burned was the first fire. And that is definitely um, shows the character of Cleopatra, shows that um, kind of woman who it gets woos by not by by gold or, or clothing or anything, but by 200 bu a thousand bucks. That's my, very much my kind of woman. Um, the war went on for a while, and um, Cleopatra um, and uh, Antony were uh, beaten at the Battle of Actium, and uh, between Octavian and Mark Antony. Um, both decided to kill themselves in 31 BC, and that ended that period in the life of Alexandria as a city. Octavian later was named Augustus um, Caesar, and he was the leader of the Roman Empire at the time. Uh, he made Egypt a provenance of the Roman Empire, so Egypt was no longer at that point an independent state. Uh, from that point onward, the Romans ruled Egypt and started the prosecution of the Christians in Alexandria. This resulted in a rebellion against the Roman. And another woman that is um, also in this part of the, uh, uh, in this time of history was of a great role was Queen Zenobia of Tadmor or Palmyra. And she conquered Alexandria after seeing how the Romans have destroyed a great deal of things and how they have killed hundreds of thousands of people who um, uh, um, became Christians. And so she um, came to Egypt. She had been able to regain Alexandria for a year, she lost it back again to the Roman, and she was shackled in, uh, they say, shackles of gold, and then she was killed later. Augustus burned everything, including what remained of the library. So for, uh, from 30 BC to 200 AD, Egypt was, um, um, uh, became, became uh, part of the Roman Empire, the emergence of Christianity. San Mark brought um, um, Christianity to Africa through Alexandria, and for that he was very tolerant of people who had pagan religions. Uh, but after that, um, uh, Philadelphus began the prosecution of the Christians. There were riots and wars everywhere. Um, the star burning of the royal quarters, and then after that, they um, burned the Serapium. Uh, Roman um, uh, Emperor Theodos uh, issued an edict to burn all in uh, the, um, the remaining part of the Serapium. This is a papyri that exists in Vienna, the National Library of Vienna Papyri Library, and it shows where he is giving the edict to burn the remaining part of um, uh, the pagan's representation. Um, one of the saddest stories in history in, that happened to a scientist is Hypatia. Hypatia was an astronomer and a philosopher and a mathematician. She was the last recorded scientist in the Library of Alexandria. Her death at 415 AD marked the end of the Library of Alexandria. She was viciously killed, cut to pieces, 
meat of the, f the flesh of the bone was scraped and lit in fire. I mean, there was no more violent deaths that had been recorded in ancient history than what had been done to this woman. And because his place, her place in history, um, there were, um, there is um, uh, um, a crater on the moon that is named after her. Uh, the Bibliotheca Alexandrina lived for 600 plus years. It was the center of the world learning at the time. It gave us a great deal of um, uh, um, material that we deal with until now, science and, and the beginning of scientific and engineering advancement. It gave us in the, um, a terminology like inter alia, uh, science theories. Um, it also recorded the first scientific complaint as um, there's so much material and we cannot read all that. I mean, you know all familiar with this complaint if you work in a library. Um, it is definitely uh, the uh, Ptolemies spend a great deal of money uh, on, the, um, on the scientist, he would bring the scientist from all over the world, and at that some point he would um, he had uh, living quarters for them in the royal quarter. He had uh, give them allowances. He had their families living in the city. They would allow to visit with their families, and at the same time he paid for all their family um, housing and um, a living. Um, so what is left of today is of the ancient library, absolutely very little, if any. Um, but it left a great deal of legacy for all of us. Um, during the expedition, the sea expedition of finding some of the ancient parts of the library, the statue of Ptolemy I was retrieved. That statue was down in the sea in three pieces. It came out um, and then this is one of the coins that I told you about that it shows the columns of the library. And this is the head of the column. It's really kind of amazing when you see all these things together. Some of that stuff is remaining under the sea because of the danger of bringing it out after all three, 2,000 years in salt water. It can disintegrate if it comes up. So the Alexandria city is planning of an undersea museum. But we have taken Ptolemy out. He went to France for treatment. He stayed in fresh bass water for on a daily basis to get that 2,000 years salt out of him. When you get to the Library of Alexandria, it's right on the entrance greeting you as you go into the library. So with that history and legacy, we needed to build a, a new library. And the new Library of Alexandria is almost a stone's throw away from where the older library is. If you look at this picture, you will see the Mediterranean Sea. And because the Mediterranean Sea is um, the sea drive and a major um, artery for the, the major artery in Alexandria. Alexandria is a small strip of land. It is 16 miles long. Um, you could not build right on the sea. So they built it as a sun disk. And you see of this picture over here, this is an aerial picture. And this is also, but it just it takes a side. What you see here, it is the sun disk. They built a pool of water around it because the sun comes every day with new knowledge. So that is the concept. This is uh, the people who built this library. Uh, called um, an office, it's, um, a cooperation between some Norwegian and Egyptian office. It, the office called Sonahetta. Actually, they recently built the North Carolina Public Library and the 9-11 um, Memorial. Uh, so what you see is around that whole building is made of a stone, granite stone from Aswan in Upper Egypt and it had the word alphabet written on it, alphabet, no words. And this is the stone, what you see, and you see the pool of water around it. The library was opened in 2002, and it had a very precise mission, is to become the word window in Egypt, and Egypt's window in the world, and an instrument to ch the challenges of the digital world and a center for dialogue. 
It was dedicated to honor the past of the Great Library of Alexandria, celebrate the present, and embrace the future. Because of the same concept that we talked about, at the Library of Alexandria is a place of learning, not just a library with a bunch of shelves and, and, and tables. It is a great place that had all kinds of ways of learning, and it had a library that eight million volume. It had as the only center for the Internet Archive outside San Francisco. Um, it has nine specialized library, five museums, a planetarium, an exploratorium for children, a culturama, which is a cultural panorama, um, and um, a cave, um, um, 3D cave, 30, 15. Uh, actually, I was told yesterday there are 19 permanent exhibitions, four art galleries, and a conference center. It has a bunch of research centers that are specialized academically in all these topics, that being calligraphy, information science, art, science. And it also is a secretariat of a, a, a big number of um, word um, organizations do exist in that uh, library, including for the librarian IFLA. Um, the IFLA Arabic Center is in there. Um, IFLA stands for the International Federation for Library Association. Um, it, the library is absolute beauty. It's breathtaking. Seven floors are open to one another, and they are accessible both by elevators and stairs on the side. This is a library sh a shot, and I always brag I took this picture, so I'm very happy with myself for taking it. Um, it's a, a beautiful place. It had material from um, all over the world, including what you see is American oak. And this is another shot. You can see um, the columns look like the lotus column, which is a lotus uh, plant of Egypt. Uh, the, um, and you will see also, um, we have a complex of fire. You can figure that out by now. Um, every three floors, they would have a curtain that a fire curtain that comes from that very high ceiling all the way down to isolate floors from one another. When you have such an open space, you could be in jeopardy. We have a library for the visually impaired, a library for arts and multimedia, young people's library for age 12 to 16, and a children's library from age, five, uh, from age one to five. Um, this is the first library in Egypt that does services for the mentally disabled. And as you see, the librarians include them in all kinds of things, including um, we have something called Sport Day. We have a science fair that for libraries, for students um, around the, in Egypt, about 20,000 students come in the science fair. We do all kinds of celebration where all these um, uh, people with disabilities, being mental or visual or hearing, they are included. We also celebrate something called the Orphan Day. We have a geography library and a map library. We have a repository library, so we have repositories, not only like the American government printing um, uh, office, uh, World Bank, um, the USAID, um, the European Union. We have the, we are, the library is the force holder of the largest collection of Francophone outside Francophone countries. And we work for about four years on getting 500,000 volume of books that they donated from the National Library of France. Bibliothèque Nationale de France, you can see the boxes here when they send us the material, and it came in a number of ships and a number of cranes. We have a rare book collection, we have a rare map collection, and we also offer all kinds of digital information. As you see, um, EBSCO, we have a manuscript museum, antiquities museum, science museum for children, we have a museum for uh, President Sadat and all the archives of uh, President Nasser and President Sadat. We had become by default the presidential library because we have been um, 
until recently we had only three presidents, so we had <laughs> their paper. This is the President Sadat is quite an emotional thing because this is the last image for President Sadat. And this suit is the suit he was killed at, and the suit with all the bullets and that had gone through it, and the blood is in, displayed in the museum. We have a full-size planetarium, uh, the Culturama, um, the Internet Archives, or the Wayback Machine, and this is a picture for the archive whose beta boxes it holds millions of data. This is the, the digital cave. Uh, this is a print-on-demand machine. We have more than 350,000 books that are completely digitized. If um, some of them are not circulating, but any of our patrons can ask for a book. This is called the Book Expresso Machine. The book comes to the computer. They can look at it at the computer. Then they can send it to the machine. They print it, and they can take the book. And the cost of the book is divided between the royalties for the publisher, the library, and the author. So, and this is... We have a number of huge projects around the city. One of them is a, an older Indian project that we implemented in Alexandria. It's called Hole in the Wall, and it is allows poor students, uh, poor um, children who don't have any access to the internet. We build these internet connections out in the streets, and it's only for young people. No adult can use it, really, so there's no hope for pornography for any of them. It is only children that can go and put their hands through these little slots. Our bookmobile was completely electronic. As you see, this is a tiny bookmobile, and um, the librarian would have a bunch of uh, fold-up tables. They, fold, they pull them out, and there's a computer, a printer, and uh, two printers, one that prints the text and one prints the cover of the book in color. And we have a binding machine, so most people in poor area don't own books, and books are expensive, so we leave the books. This is one of the only library that I know of. It's a library in Argentina that had a ballet company, and this is, but we have our full orchestra, and we have um, a huge conference center. One of the rooms in the conference center takes 1,700 people. There is more than 100 concerts and performances happen a year, 700 type of events, including international conferences, um, a lot of visitors. Four of these people are Nobel laureates. Um, we have hosted the World Summit in Information Technology and um, the Freedom of Information, and those were with IFLA, and this is our big theater. Um, another theater, and we do um, concerts, free concerts in the summer in the plaza. Um, this is uh, a dance group. And then came the revolution in Egypt um, three years ago. And what you see, people were out in the streets. You can see the smoke that you see is from the governor's office in Alexandria, which was burned to the ground. But when it came to the library, the library had grown on the Alexandrian people. 1.5 million people visit this library every year. And what happened is the people of Alexandria stood outside the library to protect it. They held hand and um, all around the library for nobody to get in, throw a stone. They had the staff did that. The staff created that big, huge flag of Egypt and put it around the library. And this is really all done by a small group of individuals. Some of them, like myself, an expat, and others were young Egyptian talents. And certainly, the Library of Alexandria had had a great impact on the city. And I believe it, it had been some of the greatest times that I have had in my life is being there, although I was working like 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. I think it is really had been um, the nice, the, the most positive time I ever spent in my life. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>